Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We're taking a look today at the HP Spectre X360 13.5. This is a pretty lightweight Intel-based 2-in-1 with an OLED display in the configuration that we're looking at today. So this can work as a laptop, it can work in tent mode here, you can have it in display mode, and of course use it as a tablet if you want. And we're going to be taking a closer look at this new device and what it's all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this is on loan from HP. So we're done with this. It goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this Spectre is all about. Now the price point on this comes in at around $1749 as configured. That's with the OLED display we have here. With an LED display and an i5 processor, these start at around $1,200 or so. And of course, the price varies based on where you buy it and how you configure it. This one has an i7-1255U processor. This is a lower powered variant of the 12th generation Intel chips. So a little uh, lower performing versus the more power hungry P series chips that you might see on laptops out there. We'll look at the performance, of course, on this in a little bit. 16 gigabytes of memory is on this one. That RAM is not upgradable, so you have to choose the amount of RAM you want when you purchase. This one has a one terabyte NVMe SSD that is upgradable along with its Wi-Fi card. Now the display on all models will be a three by two display at 13.5 inches. This one, as I mentioned, is running with the OLED display, which looks spectacular. You get very deep blacks on this and a very high quality image. The OLED also runs at a higher resolution, 3000 by 2000 versus 1920 by 1280 on the LED displays that they're also offering. Uh, this one runs at 400 nits. The LED displays run at the same level of brightness. However, they do have a 1000 nits display with a privacy screen on it. So there are a couple of different display options, but I really do prefer the OLED here. One thing to note though on the OLED is that it will consume a little more battery power than the LED displays might. And one way to conserve that power is to of course run the display at a lower level of brightness, but also uh, to have your display running in dark mode here, which will consume less power. Generally though, you'll get about eight-ish hours of battery life out of this machine doing basic tasks with the OLED. You'll probably do closer to nine or 10 hours with the LED display, also with its brightness down, also doing more basic tasks. And the OLED displays just consume more, but they do look really, really nice. And this one of course looks even nicer because it is running at a higher resolution. Now the build quality on this is quite nice. It's got a good hinge on it that keeps the display in place without bouncing around a lot. It's very easy to flip it around into different modes. It's not all that heavy either. It comes in at just around three pounds or 1.36 kilograms. So it won't weight your bag down all that much. It's got a good keyboard and trackpad here as you can see. The keys are backlit. They're pretty well spaced. They've got that familiar square look that we've come to uh, know from HP, and there's a good amount of key travel on it. I really like the trackpad. It's very accurate. Uh, this is a physical click pad, and you can click just about anywhere on the pad, almost to the top here, and still have clicks registered. So it feels like a really nice uh, overall package here for typing and general navigation. There are a number of ports on this one, and like some other HPs we've looked at, they're pretty creative in where they put them. So you can see here, you've got these flattened out corners here, and the headphone microphone jack is there. This port here is a full-size USB-A port, but they have a little door on it so they can keep the laptop thinner. So if you have a keyboard or mouse or something to attach, you can put it in there just by opening up the little door. On the other side here, we have a micro SD card slot, and then two Thunderbolt 4 ports. You got one here and another one here on the corner. And this is a good spot to plug the power cord into, but you can plug the power cord into either one of these ports. And because these are Thunderbolt ports, you can connect an external GPU if you want, or any other USB or Thunderbolt peripheral. And of course, those Thunderbolt 4 ports are full service ports. So in addition to power going in, you can get video out from the laptop to an external display. 
You can plug in docking stations and get power in, video out, and data devices all working over a single cable. The webcam here looks pretty nice. It is a 1080p webcam. I shot this with just basic room lighting, and even though it was kind of dark in the room, I thought it did a nice job of exposing me properly without a lot of noise. So they do some AI stuff with the image to make it look a little better. They have an app built in called Glam Cam that you can use to make adjustments to things. So right now it's got the appearance filter on, which smooths out my skin a bit. I can turn that off. They have another app that loads up where you can adjust the white balance and whatnot. You can also have the camera do a crop and zoom automatically where it follows you around. So if I go over here to auto frame, as you can see here, it's zooming in and kind of following my face as I move around the scene here. And that's something you could enable if you're doing a lot of web conferences and that sort of thing. And these are kind of designed for the hybrid worker in mind. And your image will probably look a little better than some of the other folks on your call with this feature enabled. There's also a shutter to close the webcam when you're not using it. And it's a digital shutter, but it's tied to a key here. So if I click on the no camera key, you'll see that it puts a little shutter up in front of the camera lens and then turns it off. So you can uh, block the lens here without having to attach a piece of tape to your laptop. Now, our review loaner came with an HP pen. We've seen this pen before. It's got a built-in battery and you recharge it with its built-in USB Type-C port here. And it will nicely attach itself to the side of the laptop here magnetically and it will hold on even when you close the lid on it. So it feels like you can walk around with the pen attached a little bit when you are out and about. And the pen works pretty nicely. Like other Windows devices, it will detect the presence of the pen a few millimeters off the screen. And when you rest your wrist down to write, it will ignore any other touch input. And it feels pretty good as I write here. This is the Microsoft Journal app that I'm playing around with here. The screen is a little slippery when you're writing, at least here on the OLED version. The pen does have pressure sensitivity, so if I just do a light touch here, we get a very light line. And if I push down harder, I get a darker line here. But all in, I think if you're looking to take notes or do some basic artwork, this should work out quite nicely, especially when it's in tablet mode. And I found the Spectre here performs quite nicely. We'll begin with some of the basics here, a little web browsing. And we are browsing the web wirelessly, of course, off of my Wi-Fi 6 access point here in the room. As you can see, everything is very snappy and responsive here, as we would expect out of a top-end laptop like this one. So I think if you are uh, just doing the basics, uh, this is going to do well, not only for web browsing, but also Microsoft Office tasks and other basic work activities. Now, I've also got a 4K 60 frames per second video playing back here from one of my YouTube channels. And if I have the laptop plugged in, it plays back perfectly. But when I pull the power cord on it here, you'll start to see it dropping frames because it does run at a slightly lower level of performance when it is on battery. But of course, you could probably tweak that a bit. One other thing to note on these 3x2 displays is that you will see a slightly larger letterbox on the top and bottom when you're playing back 16 by nine content like this. And that's due to the fact that this screen is more square than we see on many other laptops. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 271. And that puts this computer in a very competitive place against some of the other 12th generation Intel machines that we have looked at recently. Now the speakers on this are downward firing. There are four of them. And I found it sounds better in laptop configuration, although that will vary based on what surface the laptop is sitting on. But the speakers did get a little tinny when I reoriented things into the display mode here. So if you are listening to music, I still think headphones are the best way to go, but the sound is nice and rich. You've got good stereo separation and it's very clear, especially if you are using this for web conferencing. Let's take a look now at some video editing. All right, so we are running DaVinci Resolve here with a very simple video editing project. These are two 4K60 clips that we have strung together here. Now, this laptop does not have a discrete GPU. It is just relying on the Intel graphics built into its CPU. So this is going to be better suited for basic video editing tasks like we're doing here, stringing clips together, maybe some basic effects here like a cross dissolve, which you can see rendered here in real time 
but if you do more complex things like color grading and other higher end production types of things, this laptop is not gonna do it for you unless you plug in an external GPU. But for casual video and photo editing, I think this will do just fine with the built-in Intel graphics and this OLED display really looks nice for doing creative work. So let's take a look now at some games. We'll start with Red Dead Redemption 2 running at 1080p at the absolute lowest settings. And like other Intel chips from this generation, we're getting about 25 to 30 frames per second. It won't rival a gaming laptop, of course, with a discrete GPU, but this is a very playable, casual experience here for this AAA title. So that's always good to see. We also pushed the envelope here a bit. We loaded up Doom Eternal running at the native resolution of the 3000 by 2000 OLED display here. And we were getting about 20 to 25 frames per second, sometimes getting into the 30 FPS territory. But if we ran this at 1080p, of course, we would get uh, easily 30 frames per second, if not a little more. We also booted up Fortnite, again, at the native resolution of the display, lowest settings. And here it was very playable, often well above 30 frames per second with a few dips here and there, uh, but certainly a playable experience at the native resolution. And we could probably squeeze even more FPS out of the game here if we ran it at a lower resolution. So all in, if you are looking at this for a college laptop where you're gonna be casually playing games every now and then, it will do quite well playing those games even without an external GPU attached. And on the 3 d Mark Times by Benchmark test, we got a score of 1,817. That puts this right in line with other machines we've looked at with these new 12th generation chips. You will see though that the graphics scores here are very similar to the 11th generation, and that's because on the new 12th generation chips here, the CPU performance was given a speed boost, whereas the graphics kind of stayed about the same. But all in for casual gaming, this performs quite well. And on the 3D Mark stress test, we got a passing grade of 97.8%. That indicates that the machine will not throttle down all that much when it's placed under heavy load. There is, of course, a fan on board to keep the CPU cool, and it appears to be doing its job. It's not all that loud either. You will hear it kick on when you're doing tasks like video editing like we were before, but for the basics, it will largely keep itself silent. There are some system settings you can adjust to keep the fan off, but that of course will impact performance a bit. But it was nice to see that something this thin and light was able to maintain its performance under more intensive activities. All right, one last thing to check out, and that is how well it handles Linux. And we booted up the latest version of Ubuntu here. This is 22.04, and it looks like everything is working here. The touch display is getting recognized. We were able to get, of course, the video to work, audio works, Wi-Fi works, uh, pretty much everything is working here, although, the webcam with all that fancy HP stuff going on does not work, but it looks like a majority of the system here is functional running with an operating system other than Windows. So altogether, I found this to be a very nice, well-rounded system from HP. It performs very well. The OLED version here looks spectacular. It's well built, it's not all that heavy, and it can play games pretty nicely too. And if you wanted to go for the Gusto, you've got two Thunderbolt 4 ports on board to expand its graphical capabilities with an external GPU. So all in, a really nice system here from HP, and we're seeing a lot of nice laptops this year, and I'm sure we'll have more coming up soon. That's gonna do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, Chris Allegretta, Brian Parker, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Baby Metal Fox God, Tom Albrecht, Amda Brown, Matt Zagaya, and Tech Time with Eric. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv s.